We are glad to have you in our service today. I hope you have a look forward to it as much as I have looked forward uh, to this day. Uh, we have uh, planned and uh, prepared for the day and I've been praying for it. And uh, finally, it has arrived. Uh, actually, uh, started uh, yesterday and uh, we were not disappointed last night. Uh, Brother Abraham uh, preached uh, to the men. I know uh, the, the ladies were... Uh, uh, after me some about uh, having just a men's conference and uh, excluding uh, our ladies from it, but I thought our men uh, needed some talking to, and uh, Brother Abraham talked to us pretty good last night, and um, we needed it, and uh, he did a good job and challenged us well, and uh, if, uh, guys, you did not get to hear that message, we did uh, record it, and uh, I don't know when Dale will have a chance to get it up uh, for us to uh, be able to listen to, but sometime in the uh, future we'll let you know and we'll have that up and you'll be able to listen to that message. And uh, I uh, encourage you uh, to do so. And it's not that you ladies couldn't get something from it, but that was pretty much directed at the heart of men. And so uh, I would encourage men to take time and listen to that message when we get it available and, um, and let it challenge your heart for that. Uh, again, thank you for coming. If you are a visitor in our congregation today, thank you for being here. Um, we hope that you'll enjoy this time. We're not going to do anything to point you out, make you feel uncomfortable, other than say welcome. Thank you for being here and enjoy the time that you have with us. If any way we can help make your visit more comfortable, please let us know in uh, doing that. All right, welcome to our service. Uh, you enjoy uh, as well. We serve and worship the Lord this morning. We'll start this morning. We're going to group a couple of hymns together when we all get to heaven and stand up, stand up with you. 772, the first and last of 772, and then the first and last, stand up, stand up. Let's all stand. Psalms chapter 37, I'm going to read the first 20 verses. Psalms chapter 37, first 20 verses. 
You just stay seated, Brother Byron. No, no, you stay there. Brother Byron is here. I didn't make mention of it this morning. We're glad to have him. You know he's had some serious um, medical problems, and we're thrilled that he's able to come and be with us this morning. It's a good thing. But you stay seated. I think only those that, you know, the Lord knows where you have been. And so in honor, you stay right where you are, brother. Psalms chapter 37 Verse 1 says, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, <clears throat> and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword, and they have bent the bow <clears throat> and cast down the poor and needy to slay those who are of upright conduct. Their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of the many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the upright, <clears throat> and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in their evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord like the splendor of the meadows shall vanish into smoke, they shall vanish away. Amen. Amen. Tim, will you leave us in prayer? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come to your house and hear your word read to us. I pray, Lord, that each one of us will take your word and apply it to our lives, that we can all be better Christians, better witnesses for you. Lord, we pray for our services this morning, Lord. We pray for Brother Abe as he comes before us, Lord, and preaches to us. I pray, Lord, that you just... Prick our hearts, let, let us have receptive hearts, receptive minds, what you have to say through us to your word. And I pray, Lord, the revival, we start a revival service this morning. I pray, Lord, the revival will start in each one of us. Lord, just draw a circle around it and step in it, Lord, and let revival start there. I pray, Lord, that not only this church, but it will sweep out through this state and this country, Lord, where we can all get a better turn back to you. Let our leaders return to you for the wisdom and the understanding they need. Lord, pray for ones on our prayer list this morning, God. You reach down and touch and heal. We thank you, Lord, the ones that are doing some better. Continue blessing upon them where death has entered in, Lord. I pray that you just fill that vacancy with your love. I pray now, Lord, you just watch over us, care for us, and just give us a great day in your house today. We can all leave this morning and say it's a good to be in the house of the Lord. Watch over, care for each one of us now, Lord, and forgive us we fail thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Blood. 
Joshua, we haven't seen that. Y'all hear that? My phone's ringing. Excuse me just a second. Let me take this. This is Mr. Dale. Let me see what he needs. Hello? Oh, I left my mic turned off. Let me turn my mic on. There we go. Is that better? Thank you for the phone call. I appreciate it. Whew! I'm glad I took that call. Or I'd been talking the whole time. Wait a minute, I got another call. Excuse me just a minute. This is my daughter, Jordan. Let me take this and see what's going on here. Hello? Uh, oh, really? I left my candy bucket sitting over there on the chair. Would somebody mind grabbing me that candy bucket right there and bring it over here for me? Thank you, Jordan. I appreciate that. Whew! I'm glad I took that call, too. We'd be in a mess. The thing is, I, I usually leave my cell phone turned off during church. And, uh, well, there we go again. That's Mr. Josh Gordon. I better see what he needs. Let's see here. Hello? Hey, go dogs. Go dogs. Yeah. Everybody to come for the revival services tonight at 6 o'clock in Antioch. All right. Thank you, Mr. Josh. I appreciate that call. I'm glad I took... Did y'all hear that? We got revival starting up tonight. I'm glad I took that phone call, too. I forgot to mention it. Oh, that was your dad. Yep. Go dogs. I'm glad I took that phone call. I tell you what, I better put my phone on silent so we don't get any more calls like that. You know, I get calls quite often at work. And uh, sometimes, it's, well, it seems like they always come in when I least need them to be calling. My phone rings, and I'm busy. I got my hands on something. I'm pulling wire, doing something like that, and my phone rings, and I just can't answer it. It's just not a good time. Does that ever happen to y'all? You don't have a phone? Well, let me ask you something. You ever been outside? You ever been outside playing, and mama or daddy or grandma or somebody comes to the door and says, hey, so-and-so's calling, and they want to talk to you. And you're just playing so hard, you really don't want to stop playing. But you go over there and you answer the phone anyway. Has that ever happened to you? No? Well, it's happened to me. My phone rings all the time. And sometimes I just don't want to answer it. And it got me to thinking about something. You know, we get called by God. Did you know that? The Bible talks about it. And uh, as a matter of fact, God calls us a lot. Uh, this is the verse I settled on. It's, it's Matthew twenty-two fourteen. It says, for many are called, but few are chosen. But I want to show you something special about this. When I was looking for just the right verse this morning, I want to show you how many verses came up when I searched God's call. You ready? I'm going to start at the top right here. Can everybody see my phone? You ready? I'm still scrolling. I'm still scrolling. Still scrolling. Still scrolling. I'm getting closer. Still going. There we go. Do y'all see all those Bible verses? God calls us a lot. It doesn't come in the form of a, a phone call on my phone. He calls in many forms. Remember, he, he called Moses in the form of a fire. fire and a fire bush. That's right. A bush that caught on fire and God spoke to him. Moses. And God talks to God calls me usually. It's in a very still voice, a tug on my heart, a tug on my emotions, and he calls me. And can I tell you guys something that's embarrassing to me? And I'm telling you this so that you'll learn from it. There has been times in my life that God called me, and I ignored the call. I didn't answer. One time, Brother Bruce preached a good sermon. Y'all know he gets real fired up. It was a good sermon, and at the end of the sermon, I felt God tugging on my heart that I needed to come down, and I needed to pray. And you know what I told God? You know what I told him? Now is not a good time. We'll talk about it later. I'll be home. I'll say my prayers tonight. We'll talk about it then, but this is not a good time. Can you imagine the, my audacity to tell God this is not a good time to take your call? Can you imagine that? I did it. And you know what? Sometimes we all get busy, and it seems like that's when God calls on us. It's when we're busy. And sometimes we tend to say, God, let's let it wait a little while. I'll talk to you about it tonight. 
It's not a good time. Don't ignore God's call. Okay? This week is Revival Week. Mr. Josh just reminded us of it. And it was very important that I answered my phone call or I would have forgot to mention it. This is Revival Week, and we have asked God, we have called God and asked Him to call on us. Don't ignore His phone call. If you feel God tugging on your heart this week, or any time, if you feel God tugging on your heart telling you that you need to pray, or that you need to read the Bible, or that something that you just heard was very important to your life, stop right then and answer God's call. Hear what he has to say. Okay? And let's make that a, a lifelong decision, something we all need to get better at, particularly Mr. Josh, this Mr. Josh. Okay? And I'm certainly going to try. All right, let's say a prayer, and uh, let's ask God to help us with that. And when we're done, ladies first, let's, uh, let's, we're going to pass out some candy. I got a candy bucket, okay? All right. Yeah, bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you that in it you tell us, God, that you... You call us, Lord. You call us because you want to talk to us. You want to hear from us. And you want us to hear from you. Lord, thank you for being such a wonderful father. God, help us this week and for the rest of our lives that when you call on us, we don't ignore you. We answer the call. Lord, help us to answer that call, to tell you what's going on in our lives, and to hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. waiting for somebody to bring up about college football, but Josh did it. Go dogs. Let's be in deep, deep prayer for Alabama. <laughs> Days will get better someday, okay? All right. Enough of that. Off to a hymn, 330. Are you washed in the blood? Let's all stand. <laughs>
Father God, we thank you for today, Lord, and we just thank you for everybody that come out this morning, dear Lord, to, to study and learn more about you, dear Lord, and we get into our service this morning. Just give Brother Abraham the words we need to hear, dear Lord. Just thank you for him and his family, dear Lord, and thank you for his ministry, dear Lord. And just thank you for our church and our church family, dear Lord, and just thank you for watching over us this week, dear Lord, and keeping us safe, dear Lord, even when we weren't acting the best, dear Lord. We just thank you for being a, a loving and a forgiving, merciful God, dear Lord. Just ask you to be with those on the prayer list, those that lost loved ones, those that need salvation, dear Lord, that something said today, dear Lord, we we'll just bring them to you, dear Lord, for it's ever too late and accept that free gift of salvation, dear Lord. We just thank you and we love you and forgive us where we fall short. We ask all this in your name. Amen. 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 Baptist Church is in all activities to glorify God as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to call saints to worship and sinners to repentance. special uh, this morning and for you guys uh, singing. Uh, now we're thrilled to uh, introduce to you Abraham uh, Hamilton III. I'll introduce him uh, pretty much the same way I did last night to our um, men's uh, conference. Uh, Abraham's uh, primary uh, job in his life is first of all to be husband to his wife Maria who is sitting beside of him uh, tonight and then uh, his uh, other primary job is to be father to his uh, six ch children, which he has uh, with him. And I uh, will not try to name each one of them. I don't yet have all of their names. I think I could name four, four of them, but I haven't got all of their names down yet. But his six children, which he has uh, with him uh, tonight. Then when uh, he is uh, not doing his uh, primary job, uh, his secondary job is he's general counsel to American Family uh, Radio, which uh, you can hear uh, at 90.3 uh, here. He also has a uh, talk radio program on 90.3 at 6 o'clock in the afternoon Eastern time uh, here uh, that you can listen to, and um, he'll tell you what he thinks. And he is pretty much the same way on his radio program that he, uh, he is any other time. It's not something he just puts airs on. He just pretty well is himself. Uh, which is amazing. <laughs> and so, uh, but uh, we are thrilled that uh, uh, Abraham would come 
and spend this uh, week with us. Uh, he tells me that this is the longest he's away from the uh, program and uh, his duties there uh, that he's been this year or will be uh, this year. So we're glad that he would take this time out of his schedule, bring his family with him, and come out and be with us in Isabella for this period of time. So we're glad to welcome Abraham Hamilton III to our pulpit this morning. Oh, man, good morning. <laughs> he made me laugh when he said, well, he'll tell you pretty much what he thinks. <laughs> uh, it, it is true. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm pretty much the same. I, um, a lot of people don't know this, and I said this to the men last night, uh, but when I joined uh, American Family Association and American Family Radio, uh, I didn't do so to do anything on the radio. In fact, I never envisioned I would ever do anything on the radio. The first person to ever mention anything to me about the radio was my wife. <clears throat> right there, she said, Abe, I think you need to be on the radio. And I said, woman, you're crazy. What do I need to be on the radio for? <laughs> you know, uh, I actually joined AFA and AFR solely to, to serve in the general counsel capacity, to be behind the scenes as their attorney, you know. Uh, but as most of you, many of you already know, the Lord has his plans. And, uh, and I'm grateful to be a part of his kingdom and to follow his plans. Well, I'm going to minister this morning uh, from 2 Chronicles chapter 16. Don't worry, it's just 13 verses in there. 2 Chronicles chapter 16. Um, and I don't often title sermons, but I felt impressed from the Lord to title this one, uh, Latter Years Departure. Latter Years Departure, Second. Chronicles chapter 16. I'll pray, then we'll jump right into the Lord's Word. Lord, thank you, Lord, for the honor and the privilege, Lord, to be able to sing what we sang just a few minutes ago about being washed in the blood of the Lamb. Uh, Lord, having the penalty for our sins satisfied on the cross. Lord, we thank you for that honor, for that privilege. Lord, I also thank you for the opportunity to be a part of uh, Antioch Baptist Church and Isabella's Revival Week, Lord. And I pray for all of us, Lord, myself included, that this would be a week, uh, Lord, where we would once again uh, fan a flame the commitment to follow you with everything that we have, Lord. You're worthy for us, Lord, not only to gather and sing beautiful songs to honor you, Lord, but to live lifestyles that honor you, Lord, and to be vessels through which you make your appeal to fellow image bearers around us, Lord. And so, Lord, to that end, Lord, I ask that you would help me to communicate your word to your people here this morning. Lord, I pray that it would hit the mark this morning, that the portion that you desire to be conveyed uh, would be conveyed accurately with precision, and that the, the, the cumulative effect of what is all, all that is said and done here this morning, as well as the remainder of this week, Lord, that you would have a people that are further resolved to be your peculiar people, to embrace what you've called us to, Lord, and that we would live full out for you. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. 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 So I'm going to read the verses first, all the way through, uh, verses 1 through, I said 13, it's 14 verses, I'm sorry, uh, in uh, this chapter, and then unpack it a bit with the remaining time. All right, verse 1, 2 Chronicles 16, 1. In the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Baasha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and built Ramah that he might permit no one to go out or come into Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa took silver and gold from the treasuries, from the treasures of the house of the Lord and the king's house and sent them to Benadad, king of Syria, who lived in Damascus, saying, There is a covenant between me and you, as there was between my father and your father. Behold, I am sending to you silver and gold. Go break your covenant with Basha, king of Israel, that he may withdraw from me. And Benadad listened to King Asa and sent the commanders of his armies against the cities of Israel. And they conquered Ejon, Dan, abel Maim, and all the store cities of Naphtali. And when Baasha heard of it, he stopped building Ramah and let his work cease. Then King Asa took all Judah and they carried away the stones of Ramah and its timber, with which Baasha had been building, and with them he built Geba and Mizpah. At that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa king of Judah and said to him, because you relied on the king of Syria and did not rely on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Syria has escaped you. 
Were, were not the Ethiopians and the Libyans a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he gave them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. You have done foolishly in this, for from now on you will have wars. Then Asa was angry with the seer and put him in the stocks in prison, for he was in a rage with him because of this. And Asa inflicted cruelties upon some of the people at the same time. The acts of Asa from the first to the last are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was diseased in his feet, and his disease became severe. Yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but sought help from physicians. And Asa slept with his fathers, dying in the 41st year of his reign. They buried him in the tomb that he had cut out for himself in the city of David. They laid him on a beer that had been filled with various kinds of spices prepared by the perfumer's art, and they made and they made a great fire in his honor. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Now, starting right at the beginning, it's always interesting, and my children will tell you this. Um, when we read the scripture, there are no extra details. There are no superfluous details. Nothing is included in there that is insignificant. When the Lord gives us details, he gives us those details for a reason. So when we, when we see this scene, if you will, in Asa's life, and we're introduced in verse 1, to the fact that the events that are recorded in chapter 16 of 2 Chronicles, they all transpire in the 36th year of Asa's reign. That should cause us to st stop for a second and say, wait, wait, wait a minute. Why are we picking up at this point in the 36th year of his reign? Just to do a little bit of background, this is very early in the history of Israel and Judah, specifically Judah, operating as a southern kingdom. If you remember, the very first king of all of the unified nations of Israel was Saul right? After Saul, we have David. After David, who's next? Solomon. After Solomon, who became king of the unified nation of Israel? Rehoboam, all right? Rehoboam. I could spend a lot of time talking to you about Rehoboam, but I'm not going to do that this morning. All right, after Rehoboam, Rehoboam has a son who serves as, well, let me go back. Rehoboam, during his reign, that was a time where the nation of Israel was divided into two separate countries, two separate nations. The northern kingdom, having ten tribes, was referred to from that point forward as Israel. From that point forward, the southern kingdom, having the tribes of Ju Judah and Benjamin, basically, are known as the nation of Judah. Rehoboam presides for a while over the nation, the southern nation of Judah as king, and then after him, his son Abijah was the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. After Abijah, we have King Asa. So this is very early in the history of Judah as a southern kingdom. And chapter 16 begins by telling us that these events unfold in the 36th year of Asa's reign. Well, if you toggle back to chapters 14 and 15 of 2 Chronicles, which we won't do now, the Bible tells us that the first 10 years of Asa's reign as the king of the southern kingdom of Judah, he had peace. There was no war. No war at all. And in the 11th year of Asa's reign, the Bible tells us that several nations came against Judah in war. The nations of Ethiopians and Libyans, where over a million soldiers attacked the southern kingdom of Judah. Well, at that time, Asa, having no experience as a wartime king, he did what many of us would do, having our first experiences, if we are submitted to the Lordship of Christ. He cried out to the Lord. And my son likes when I said that, say it like this. He said, Lord, help me. <laughs> oh, Lord, help me. The people that are coming for me, they're trying to kill me, Lord. I don't know what to do. Help me, Lord. I ain't never been in a battle. I never had to put them up, put them up. And so the Lord, in response to that, delivers Asa in the southern kingdom of Judah mightily, all right, mightily. From that point on, in the 11th year of, Jude, of Asa's reign, until the 36th year of Asa's reign, he once again enjoyed peace. And so we pick up in chapter 16, in the 36th year of Asa's reign, and he's no longer the king who has never known war. He now is Kalapop and Asa, who has been victorious over an army much larger than his own, which is why we have that introduction there in the 36th year of Asa's reign. 
Now, right in the beginning, in verse 1, there's an amazing contrast that happens. Because remember what I said to you, when the million-plus army came from Ethiopia and Libya, Asa cried out to the Lord. Well, in the 36th year of his reign, verse 1 in chapter 16 says, Baasha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and built Ramah. All right? Now, one of the things that happened consistently after Judah and Israel were divided into two separate nations, they often had skirmishes, arguments, beef about territorial boundaries. All right? Well, how much of this land is actually going to be Israel and how much of this land is going to be Judah? And so verse 1 in chapter 16 tells us that Basha, who's serving as the king of Israel, he goes up against Judah and he builds Ramah. All right? Which may not be obvious is that Ramah is a city that is in the southern kingdom of Judah, but it's very close to the southern boundary of Israel. So to make it clear, Israel's in the north, Judah's in the south. This northern kingdom of Israel basically invades Judah. It starts, stop me, maybe you heard this before, trying to build a wall. <laughs> to say, well, you think this is part of your, southern, your sovereign territory, Judah, but we're going to take some of this land and make it a part of our kingdom. So when the Bible says Basha goes up against Judah and builds up Ramah, that's literally what the Bible is, is explaining. The northern king is trying to cut off portions of the sovereign territory of Judah and to say this is going to be a part of our country. Verse 2. And I guess and, and I'll, I'll say this. I made this note to myself. Ramah is about five to seven miles south of Bethel. Bethel was the southernmost city in the northern kingdom of Israel. I hope I'm not confusing anybody. So Bethel is the bottom city in the northern nation. Ramah is just about five to seven miles away from Bethel. So Basha thinks, eh, I'll just take a little bit more, okay? Then we get verse 2, which is a major contrast from what happened in the 11th year of Asa's reign. Then Asa took silver and gold from the treasures of the house of the Lord, and from the king's house, and he sent them to Benadad of Syria, who lives in Damascus. All right, so I'll just talk geography and monarchies first. Israel attacks Judah. Asa is the, son of the king of Judah. The Lord is revealing to us in Scripture, instead of Asa repeating what happened when the million-plus army from Libya and Ethiopia came against him, his first response now is not to cry out, oh, Lord, help me. His first response is to take money from the house of God and to take money from his own personal wealth and to basically pay a bribe to another nation. So you have Judah, you have Israel, then north of Israel you have Syria. Instead of Asa crying out to the Lord as he had done, you might describe it as when he's small in his own eyes, he's young as a monarch, Instead of crying out to the Lord, what Asa does now in the 36th year of his reign, he sends money to the northern nation of Syria. The Bible tells us specifically where he draws the money from to give us an indication as to what is actually happening. The first source of money he, draw, for, source of money he draws from is from the house of God. The Lord is revealing to us in his word at this juncture, Asa has adjusted his allegiance and his confidence away from Yahweh who had delivered him previously and is now placing confidence in a northern king. Not only is he placing that confidence there from the house of God, but even from his own personal resources. See, what may not be obvious, and this, this happens with people, unfortunately, because of the sin nature, is that there is a great temptation as things go on over time, as things begin to drift from, for a while, because when Asa was young in his own eyes, depending upon the Lord to sustain him as king of the southern kingdom of Judah, when war came, his first indication was, the, his first instinct was to cry out to the Lord. But now you see, this is 25 years later. I've been in this position for a while. I've been on the throne for a little bit. Guess what happens with monarchs who've been on the throne for a while? They have opportunities to have diplomatic incursions, you see. Now I'm not only just a brand new king of Judah, I've been king for a while. So now I've developed these relationships with other nations and with other kings. And what the Lord is revealing to us that Asa, instead of remaining dependent upon the Lord and the Lord alone, 
he now has become what I describe as professional in his kingship. Kind of like when Christians early on in our lives, when we first get saved, oftentimes that's the only time or the highest time of us being on fire for the Lord. But then as time goes on, things happen and we become kind of professionalized in our Christianity. We learn a few theological terms, you know, and we become, you know, we have perfect church attendance for a few years. And that fervent passion and dependence upon the Lord begins to wane a bit. I said to the men last night, often within the context of professionalized Christianity, we begin to live a tacit declaration of independence from God. And some of you are saying, now what does that look like, Abe? Well, I'll just tell you. A tacit declaration of independence from God looks like a person who professes to be a Christian but actually lives lives of prayerlessness. Or the only time we begin to turn to prayer is after we've exhausted all of our human ingenuity. We've used up all of our lifelines. We've called Uncle Bubba and them. They couldn't help. And then finally, after we've used all the things we know how to do, then, Lord, would you help now? And as I told the men, what that actually reveals is what we truly believe about prayer, and more importantly, what we truly believe about the God of prayer. Because if you actually believe he is the one who could reveal and could answer and restore and to resolve whatever the matter would be, would you wait until you've exhausted all of your human resources? It's a tacit declaration of independence from God. It's a life that declares, Lord, you know what? I don't need you. I got this on my own. So what the Scripture is revealing right here, and it's contrasting young in his own heart and mind, Asia, with the professional, experienced, seasoned diplomat, Asa. Instead of crying out to the Lord, his first resort is, I'm going to get some money, and I'm going to send it up north to Benadad, king of Syria. And when you see how his plan unfolds, naturally it makes sense. And let me explain what I mean. Let's go to verse 3. In providing the funds to Benadad, king of Syria, Asa says, there's a covenant between me and you, Benadad. Behold, I am sending you silver and gold. Break your covenant with Basha, king of Israel, that he may withdraw from me. Look at verse 4. And Benadad listened to King Asa and sent commanders of his army against the, uh, the cities of Israel. And they conquered Ejon, Dan, abel Maim and the store cities of Naphtali. What may not be obvious as you read the text, remember the place of battle initially between Judah and Israel is in Ramah, a northern city in the southern kingdom of Judah, or south of the northern kingdom of Israel. Asa's plan is to have Damascus, have Syria, attack Israel from the north. So the cities that are listed, Ejah, Dan, abel Maim, these are all cities up north in the northern kingdom of Israel. So the plan is Asa hires Benadad, basically with a bribe, saying, I'm paying you more money than Israel ever could pay you. So because I'm paying you, won't you attack them from the north? And so Benadad says, I like that price. So he attacks Israel from the north, causing Israel's armies to retreat from being in Judah and to go up north to fight. A logical battle strategy, right? And naturally speaking, the plan would have worked. Go back to the text. Verse 5. And Basha, king of Israel, heard of the attacks up north. So what does he do? Stop building Ramah and let the work cease. Then King Asa took all Judah and they carried away the stones of Ramah and its timber with which Basha had been building. And with them he built Geba and Mizpah. So what Asa's plan was is that when Benadad attacks from the north, the Israel army retreats north, then I'm going to move and fortify a wall on my side of the border between Israel and Judah. Naturally speaking, sounds like a nice plan, right? There's only one problem with the plan. It excludes a reliance on the Lord. See, I say all the time, when good contrasts or rivals God, one O has got to go. What the scripture is revealing, again, is Asa is so persuaded that his professional diplomatic skills are the way to resolve this issue, and it stands in stark contrast to what happened in year 11 of his reign. It's showing that Asa's heart is turning away from being passionately and reliantly dependent upon the Lord 
and the way he's depended upon his own ability as a skillful monarch and diplomat to get things done. And as God would have it, man, I love the Lord so much so. Verse 7, at that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and confronts him. It says to him, because you relied on the king of Syria and did not rely on the Lord your God, the army of Syria has escaped you. Brothers and sisters, this is an Old Testament demonstration of the New Testament reality. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. All temptation is common to man. There's no sin that's confronted any person that has not confronted other people all throughout human history. But the Lord reveals that with the temptation, God provides a way of escape. When the scripture shows that at that time, the Lord sends Hananiah the seer to confront Asa, you can envision Asa is almost in, you know, an Old Testament Judah situation room and speaking with his cabinet about his plan. And the Lord sends a prophet to go and confront him at that very moment, providing with him a way of escape, providing Asa an opportunity to humble himself and to say, what am I doing? Why did I do what I did when the Ethiopians and the Libyans attacked? Lord, forgive me for thinking I could resolve this on my own. But Asa doesn't do that. Asa doesn't do that. Hananiah continues, verse 8, Were not the Ethiopians and the Libyans a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? See, what may not be obvious again is that the Ethiopians and Libyans posed a much larger threat than Israel posed at that time. But the prophet is saying, didn't the Lord carry you through an even greater threat before? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he gave them into your hand. See, brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something. The thing that's necessary for the body of Christ today is the same thing that's always been necessary for the body of Christ throughout all of human history. There are people that think, oh, well, you know, this is a new time. we got to have a freshest latest. You know, we need to draw the young people. We need to get the smoke machines. And we need to get the bright lights. We got to get the dude with the skinny pants on, you know? And the pants so high, you want to show everybody his socks. And he, you know, rocks like this. And that's what we have to do to get him in. And you have the entire thrust of the body of Christ truly adjusting to accommodate wickedness, but saying, we just, we're just trying to draw people. When the reality is, if you draw people with the flesh, guess what it's going to take to keep them? Flesh. See, the Lord called his church to be the ecclesia, the called out ones. The purpose of the gathering of the Lord's bride is for the saints to be equipped for ministry. It doesn't mean unbelievers can't come. Unbelievers are welcome, but we're not going to change the entire thrust, tone, and tenor of the gathering of the Lord's saints to accommodate rebellion. And in many places, you have truly passionate, committed Christians who are withering because they're not being fed the Word of God because the body of Christ is adjusting to reduce what should be the gathering of the Lord's saints for worship to really the newest version of a Broadway show. But we just put the word church on it and act as if God is pleased. And we say we're reaching the lost. Can I just tell you something very plainly? The evaluation of the Lord's church should never be based on the quantity of people present. It should be thrusted solely on the quality of the lives and their lifestyles. The quality of life applied in submission to the Lordship of Christ is the metric for whether or not a church is healthy or not. People will gather for a whole bunch of things. I heard somebody say earlier something called, I don't know what this means, um, go dogs. What does that mean? <laughs> I don't know. You're bark. Arr, arr, arr. I'm from the place we like tigers. Rawr. <laughs> but let me tell you, hundreds of thousands of people will gather for stuff. People will gather to see someone kick a pig skin. That doesn't mean they're gathering as unto the Lord. We have ever-increasing larger quantities of people that are just as unregenerate as people who may show up in New Orleans on Bourbon Street. But they get pacified by the fact that, hey, but look, I'm in a building that has a steeple. And I'll let you in on something that's really not a secret. Satan has no problem with people gathering buildings and calling themselves going to church. The problem that Satan has is when people become the church. You should never be able to go to a place that you're supposed to be, that we're supposed to be. 
Asa allowed time in his settling in his seat to manipulate him away from dependence upon the Lord and the Lord alone. The Lord and the Lord of first and primary significance and dependence. He became professionalized in his monarchy instead of remaining in a position where he's little in his own eyes and recognizing, recognizing, unless the Lord builds a house, they that build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And so the Lord dispatches the prophet Hananiah at the moment where he's considering this self-based, humanistic battle plan. At that very moment, the Lord sends Hananiah to confront him in that moment. Giving him that 1 Corinthians 10 way of escape from his temptation. There's a scripture, Proverbs 28, right about verse 1, that says, He who is often reproved, yet stiffens his neck, will suddenly be destroyed in that without remedy. Hananiah, has, Hananiah provides an opportunity for Asa to humble himself and repent. But look how Asa responds. I'll pick up again in verse 9 in 2 Chronicles chapter 16. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless or whose heart is whole toward him. You, Asa, have done foolishly in this. For from now on, you will have wars. Isn't it amazing? The very thing that Asa sought to avoid with his diplomatic envoy is what actually is going to come upon him because he sought to employ humanistic means and refused to rely upon the Lord. Now, instead of humbling himself and saying, Lord, you're right. Lord, forgive me for my sin. How did I become conveniently ignorant of the fact that you delivered me and our entire nation from the Ethiopians and the Libyans? But verse 10 shows Asa has a different response. Then Asa was angry with the seer and put him in the stocks in prison, for he was in a rage with him because of this. Now let me ask you all a question. Was Asa mad at Hananiah the seer or was he mad at somebody else? The Lord confronts Asa. In this exercise of rebellion, Asa's response, instead of humbling himself in contrition, they say, Lord, forgive me. The Bible says he's angry and puts the prophet in prison. Who do you think he really wanted to put in prison? He uses Hananiah, Hananiah, really to take a swipe at God. Hananiah didn't show up there on his own. Hananiah wasn't sitting down at Whataburger and saying, man, you know what, let me go in and talk to Asa. <laughs> this man is tripping. No. The Lord sends Hananiah. And instead of humbling himself, Asa lashes out at the prophet. This is the first instance in the entire history of Judah as a separate sovereign nation of a king attacking and incarcerating a prophet because of the word of the Lord. He's a forerunner for what happens later on in Judah's history with the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah had the word of the Lord, do the same thing to him, put him in the cistern, get this guy out of here. And not only that, he not only lashes out at, at the prophet Hananiah, the scripture tells us, in verse 10, the nation was angry with the seer and put him in the stocks in prison, for he was in a rage with him because of this. And Asa inflicted cruelties upon some of the people at the same time. Now, what did they do to him? The Lord confronts him in his sin, but instead of humbling himself, he stiffens up and bristles. The next thing that happens, hmm, Lord, help us. The scripture almost records this portion of Asa's life and his reign kind of like a movie, and scene. Look at verse 11. The acts of Asa from the first to the last are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. Verse 12, in the 39th year of Asa's reign. So this is now three years later. In the 39th year of Asa's reign, he is diseased in his feet, and his disease became severe. The scripture here is giving us specific indications as to the physical ailments that Asa now suffers Three years later, but it's also given us 
a symbolic representation that Asa's walk has become corrupted to where he's diseased in his feet. After having the prophetic confrontation in the 36th year of his reign, where he refuses to humble himself, the scripture has given us a depiction that that refusal to humble himself persists for an additional three years. An additional three years. And the scripture reveals why I'm, affirms what I'm saying right now. Because look at the remainder of verse 12. Yet even in his disease, yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord. See, this is how I know what I'm telling you is accurate. Because he did not seek the Lord at the threat of war. The Lord confronted him and invited him to repent. Yet Asa still refuses to seek the Lord even when his own feet become sick, become diseased. And the disease doesn't just stay benign. The scripture reveals that he becomes severe. But even in that severity, Asa still doesn't seek the Lord, but sought the help from physicians. Now, let me just make something very clear. The Lord has no problem with physicians. He's not trying to, trying to contrast seeking the Lord or physicians. That's not what he's saying at all. He's simply saying similar to the way Asa sought help from a diplomatic national sovereign in war, he likewise refuses to seek the Lord in the issue concerning his own physical body, but instead seeks physicians. The Lord loves doctors. He had one of them write one of the Gospels and the book of Acts, Dr. Luke. But here Asa refuses to humble himself before the Lord, and then guess what happens? Verse 13, and Asa slept with his fathers dying in the 41st year of his reign. <laughs> Three more years with diseased feet and continues in it for another two years. Year 36 marks a rapid departure and a metastasizing deviation away from dependence upon the Lord that Asa carries with him to his grave. Now here's one of the major things that I hope and pray that you take away from this. This is not a Hollywood movie. This is true. <laughs> At the time where Asa should have been more wise, should have been more equipped, should have been more fortified to lead the people of Judah in reliance upon the Lord, instead of wisening with older age, he goes the opposite way. Let me tell you something. Just because you may have gray hair doesn't automatically mean that you're wise. Can they see me? The Bible says a hoary head is a crown of life if it be found in the way of righteousness. Guess what that reveals? Gray hair can result in a person not being found in the way of righteousness. Wisdom is not merely the product of chronology on the Lord's earth. Wisdom is the product of chronology on the Lord's earth submitted to the Lordship of Christ. In the New Testament, the Hebrew writer says, at the time that you should be able to go and teach others, you have to be taught again the basic principles of the faith. Asa should have been more wise, more reliant upon the Lord, more able to shepherd the people of Judah in the 36th year of his reign than he was in the 10th and 11th years of his reign. But this portion of Scripture exists, and the Bible is filled with people and things that the Lord places there for us to emulate but he also has things included in the scripture for us to avoid as warnings. At the time that Asa should have been more equipped to be a man of God, he suffered a latter year departure. Instead of his experiencing submitting to Yahweh in the Old Testament, leading to him having a crescendoing witness and testimony and legacy, it's the exact opposite. The major purpose that I know for a fact that the Lord has put on my heart to, to convey this message to you this morning is to ask you a question. Have you become professionalized in your Christianity? You know, with the increase of your vocabulary and all of these Christian words, you know, has your passion for the king of glory waned? When crisis hits your life, do you have something that you do that's different than the way you normally live your life? See, we have examples in Scripture like Jesus after the Bible records he fed 10,000 men, which we know there were women and children there. So when you think of everybody was there, probably somewhere closer to 15 or maybe 20,000 people. After that amazing, what could only be described as a glorious moment, 
And the Lord, the Bible says the very next thing he does is that he retreats into the mountain to pray. <laughs> Some of us, the only time we would ever consider praying is when things are going bad. But if that is our lifestyle, truly can we say we are abiding in the vine? See, professionalized Christianity results in people's testimonies usually being, I remember when I first got saved, I used to. I remember when I first responded, I used to. But my question is, where are you today? In order for you to have a testimony, if you have to hearken back a few years, my question is, where have you been in the intervening years? Has your life, has my life become a difference between year 10 and 11, depending upon the Lord, to where now year 36, we become so accustomed to living as Christians that really the fire of Christian witness and Christian submission has ebbed away from us over time. This is something that all believers have to encounter and have to confront. When you hear the name Jesus, do your eyes well up with tears now as it used to? Or has that been something that, you know, that was back then, but now? As we sing songs in worship, are you truly worshiping the Lord or are you just singing songs? There's a difference. And the difference is internal. The outside may look the same, but you know and I know what's really going on in the inside. Has church attendance become just a feature of cultural normative? You know, I'm a good person, so I go to church. Or is your heart drawn to the place of worship because your heart is drawn to the one who you're worshiping? If we are not intentional, we can be modern day aces. And it's the Lord's will for us not to suffer a latter year's departure. But as the scripture reveals in 1 Corinthians, his desire is for us to grow from glory to glory to glory. Yeah. I shared this with the men, and this is a, a, this is a fact. And, any, and anybody thinks I'm not telling the truth, y'all can ask my wife. <laughs> I told the men, Paul said, I ain't lying, so I can say, I ain't lying. <laughs> y'all can ask my wife. I don't search this scripture to try to find something new or clever to come up with to say to somebody else. Man, I search the word of God to be transformed personally. I'm trying to live this for real. And it's the Lord's desire for all of us to live this for real. A couple things we can evaluate. When was the last time you shared the gospel with somebody else? Here's the thing. Gospel sharing is not a labor for those of us who have been captured by his glory. Because when you meet people, you meet their passion. When people meet you, what do they meet? Is it more easy for us to talk college football than it is to talk the gospel? And I'm not throwing any shade to college football. I like college football. But when I think about college football in light of the life-giving flow that is the fount of the presence of Christ Jesus, one pales in comparison. Has the life of Christ ebbed away from you over time? Or can you honestly say right here today that I am on fire for the king of glory? And not from some type of emotional arousal. You know, you can listen to a good pep talk and be hyped up emotionally. I'm not talking about an emotional arousal. I'm talking about a steady burn that is the product of the presence of the king. I tell this story often and people laugh about it. But I remember the first time somebody said something to me about being conservative politically. And I remember thinking, I didn't even know what that word meant. I didn't know what, I literally didn't know what it meant. I said, I don't know. And I, I perceived that they were trying to insult me at the time. Hey, you, you, you just so conservative. And I remember saying, man, you call me whatever name you want to call me, but I've been saved. <laughs> I'm not trying to give you some, you know, political dissertation. I am talking to you about, like the woman at the well, I met a man. I met a man. You mean to tell me that I can have a, an ability to place my confidence in a Savior who assures me that my destination is secure and have that reality wash over how I do life? Glory be to God. I don't search the word to come up with something to share. Again, my wife will tell you, I'm the exact same way right here behind this pulpit on the radio as I am at home. My children will tell you the same thing. Because this is real. 
The Lord told Ezekiel, I'm sending you to a hard-headed people. I'm telling you up front, these jokers are hard-headed. But I'm going to make your head harder than theirs, Ezekiel. And then he said this, don't be afraid of men's faces. Now, why do you think the Lord would say that to Ezekiel? Because there's a great temptation that you could be fully persuaded. You in the clouds, you like rocking, getting ready. You know, the music, da -da -da, you know? Then you step out and you start seeing people. You're like, oh, that dude looks mean over there. Oh, that, oh man, if I actually tell them what I really believe, they're not going to invite me to bridge. <laughs> they see me at Walmart, they're going to turn away and go away. But when the Lord looms larger in your heart and your mind than even yourself, you find that even that natural predilection to be hesitant ebbs away. When you have been captured by the king of glory, sharing the gospel is not laborious. It's actually sharing your heart's passion. Just like we joke around here, go dogs. That's an easy conversation around here. Why? Because people love Georgia football. So that makes it readily accessible. But what if we love the Lord God the same way? And here's the thing. The Lord has even told us, it's not your job to get anybody saved. It's just our job to be a witness. When you look at the, 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 the pinnacle apologetic scripture in the Bible, you know, 1 Peter chapter 3, always be reason to give a defense for the hope that you have, a reason for the hope that you have. The Greek word is apologia. The verses that precede it have everything to do with basic Christian living. Keep your tongue from evil. Keep your lips from deceit. Sanctify Christ in your own heart as holy. Always be ready to give a reason for the hope that you have to any who would ask you. And I know some have said, oh, that's the scripture. That means I just stand over here, play some Jeopardy music, and I wait for somebody to ask me a question about the Lord. We just wait for somebody to ask us. No, actually, what that scripture really means is that our life quality should be of such a degree to where it provokes inquiry. That our life quality is so countercultural that it provokes people to ask you questions. Questions like, Abe, you really travel with all six of your children? <laughs> or if you're from where I'm from, they say, churn. You all six of your churn? You bring them all, all of them? Yeah. Why? <laughs> Babe, they're laughing because they have the same question. That's why they're laughing so hard. They're like, ooh, my man said, y'all came with the bus? Y'all came with the bus? <laughs> why? I'll tell you very plainly why. Because parenthood, according to Scripture, is not merely the feature of biological happenstance. God tells us that children are his heritage, Psalm 127. Children are the heritage of the Lord. They have been entrusted to my wife and I for stewardship for a season. Like arrows in the quiver of a mighty warrior or the children born to one's youth. You know what the Lord showed my wife and I? That arrows are instruments that are perfectly created for their task. But in order for them to execute, they require trajectory and a direction. It's my job and my wife's job to be the primary vehicles through which Christ is introduced to them. So we want to offer them lecture and lab. We don't want to just talk about it at home, what we do. We want to show them what it looks like in practice. So we want our children to see daddy and mommy changing our schedule, being inconvenienced for the sake of the gospel. And Deuteronomy 6 instructs us how are we supposed to do this? When you walk, when you rise, when you sleep. Bottom line is, time is the most vital component of being effective in disciple-making. So we want to take every opportunity to be effective and respond to God in that endeavor. What we found is that quantity of time gives rise to quality of time. We can't pre-program those poignant moments of grace. We can't pre-program the Nighttime conversations. Daddy, I know we've been talking about salvation, but, you know, I'm just having a hard time sleeping, you know, because I just thought about it. There are a lot of people who are not saved. That's a real conversation I had with one of my daughters. Two o'clock in the morning, she can't sleep. Daddy, can I talk to you? Tears flowing down her face. Naturally, I want to say, girl, go to bed. 
But the frequency of the conversation and time spent in this endeavor is what provoked the quality moment to where she had that question at that particular time. That's why I describe what we do in our family as my full-time job because I don't get off from it. I've tried. <laughs> that's a joke, by the way. But that's why. Living in such a life quality. Man, what do you mean? So have you ever cheated on your wife? Ladies may not know this, but these are real questions men ask each other. No, man, I've never cheated on my wife. You serious? Yes, I'm serious. This is a real conversation I had as well. But you got eyes, Abe. I know you look, right? That's a real conversation. I had a sister in Christ ask me that one time. She said, Abe, don't Christian men still have to look? I said, no. What do you mean have to look? She said, well, that's what somebody told me. Actually, it was a preacher who told her that. I said, well, I'm simply telling you that's a lie. The scripture calls men of God to self-control. But the self-control, I'm just going to be very plain with you. When the scripture talks about men being the husband of one wife, it's not merely talking about fidelity. It's also talking about being a one-woman type of man in the appetite, in the desire level. Which is the next question. Abe, you mean to tell me God can change your desires, Abe? That's exactly what I mean. Remember when Jesus was preaching, he said, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, if a man looks upon a woman with lust in his heart, it's as if he created adultery with her. Jesus Christ elevated the focal point, not merely to the conduct, but to the heart condition. You could train a dog to salivate on cue. Ivan Pavlov told us that, taught us that. Ring a bell, give a treat. Ring a bell, give a treat. Ring a bell, give a treat. Next thing you know, you ring a bell, what's going to happen? Ring a bell, what's going to happen? <laughs> because the dog's conduct has been conformed. But that doesn't mean the dog has had a heart transformation. Christ came to transform us at our heart level. Yeah. And it is this heart transformation that is lived out as what accumulates as a robust witness. In Acts chapter 1, when Jesus is speaking, he's resurrected, he's talking to his apostles, and he says, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power. The word for power there in Greek is dunamis, where we get our English word dynamite. You will be endued with dynamite for what? For a purpose. It feels great to know that we're indwelled by the Spirit of God. Yes, but the indwelling of the Spirit of God is not for consumption. It's for function. You will be endued with power to what? Be my witnesses. The word for witness in Greek is martis, where we get our English word martyrdom from. We often think about martyrdom as being the cessation of natural life in furtherance of a cause. But martyrdom biblically is actually becoming the living dead. Dead to a self-willed humanistic way of life, alive to Christ. You'll be endued with power to be my witnesses. The call to be a witness is a call to be one, whether you're standing on a stage before an audience of many or before you're living if you're living before the audience of one, if nobody else is around physically, you and I are still called to be his witnesses. Because when you are transformed, you're not trying to put on a transformed performance. This is who we truly are. So just to come right down to it, and I'm going to wrap it up. I know I've been talking for a while. Asa's latter year departure should be a warning to all of us. That if we are not intentional, we can allow the professionalized drift to set in to where we just go to church. But it's the Lord's desire for us to be the church and that our life quality should be of such a degree that it provokes inquiry. How are you always so self-controlled? How are you not panicking as all of these things are going haywire? Which, by the way, being a believer doesn't mean that you won't have life on flowery beds of ease. We will have difficulty. But the reality is because of the presence of the Prince of Peace, we will navigate difficulty very differently from those who do not know him. And the life quality is of such a degree that people in real life and in interpersonal relationships will be able to ask, how are you able to handle this in such a way? And you are able to rightly recognize that this is an open door to make a gospel proclamation because the truth of the answer is the only way I'm able to navigate this is because of the one who has navigated the cross on my behalf. The Apostle Paul was able to write by the Spirit of God these light afflictions that we endure. You study Apostle Paul's life, his afflictions ain't look light to me. He's in places where they're stoning him thinking he's dead, stoning him inside of the city, dragging him outside of the city, 
And they all think he's dead. And he pops up and walks right back in the same city. Those afflictions didn't look light to me. But they're viewed as light in view of what Christ has secured on his behalf. These light afflictions cannot begin to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. It's because of that that there's a real-time, continual, passionate, vertical commitment to Christ that results in a horizontal, evident witness to the world that will cause each and every one of us to be able to man our lanes, that we'll be able to stand before the Lord, before the judgment seat, and the Lord will be able to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, because well dones are reserved for those who have done well. May our lives not be like Asus, to where we have a latter year departure, but as each day of grace is afforded to us, that we're pressed even the more, that we're conformed even the more to the likeness of Christ, where we grow even the more to where the, the lifestyle of sanctification is evident internally and externally. In Jesus' name, amen.